Tri-State Free Thinkers Podcast from April 6, 2016, Cryonics, a Humanist Imperative, with guest speaker Max Harms. My talk is about life. Um, I'm going to be talking tonight about cryonics, which is basically preserving people by reducing their temperature down very low. And I'd like to start off my talk tonight by reading a quote. I don't know how this works. Let's try that. All right. This is a quote that's often attributed to C.S. Lewis. It's actually by uh, George MacDonald. It says, you don't have a soul. You are a soul, and you have a body. Belief in souls is something of a universal across human cultures, across the globe. We can see it in the belief, come on, is this working? There we go, in ghosts, okay? The idea of a soul without a body. This idea occurs time and time again. The, uh, the human brain is sort of wired up to be dualist. A dualism is the idea that mind and body are separate, that there's a soul that is distinct from the material form, okay? This is so innate and intrinsic that psychologists have looked at young children, too young to be you know, decently indoctrinated in any sense, and you can ask them about things like stories about animals that get eaten and that sort of thing. And you ask, what is the animal feeling now? Or does the animal, is the animal thinking anything now? And they'll say, yeah, you know, the, the, if an alligator eats a mouse, sure, the mouse has you know, something to say about that after having been eaten, after it's dead, okay? The mouse's ghost lives on and has opinions and thoughts about having been eaten. So, what would it be like to be dead, right? Consider this question that we sort of ask these young children. And this is, I hope, a question that everyone in this room has thought about, at least somewhat. It's sort of a natural question that humans ask. But from my perspective, it's a strange question, okay? It's a strange question in a sense because I think of death as the elimination of the person. When a person dies, they're gone, right? So what is the experience of a person who doesn't exist? It's almost like a non-question. Your premise is bad. It's like taking a piece of paper and burning it and then asking whether or not that piece of paper is folded or not. It's like, what, is it, what does that even mean? It's, it's not there anymore. How could it be folded or not folded? Death to a theist is not the same as death to an atheist. There's a fundamental assumption that I made when I said that the idea that you can't have experience after you're dead uh, relies on. That assumption is that when a person dies, the person is gone. From a dualistic perspective, there are two types of death we can imagine. We can imagine body death, and we can imagine soul death. Theists like to think about body death all the time, right? Your body dies, and then your soul goes to heaven, or goes to an afterlife, or gets reincarnated, or whatever the specific theology is. But theists very rarely grapple with the concept of person death. This is the kind of death that keeps me awake at night, okay? It's not the idea of the death of the body, but the elimination of me as a person, or someone else as a person, that my soul, so to speak, is annihilated fully and truly. Death is real, regardless of what theists will talk about or think about. There's a way in which there's a kind of denialism that comes from believing in an afterlife or believing in souls. The immortality of the soul is a common meme in religion. And it's a comforting one, but it's a comforting lie. Death is real. But this is, this is a factual claim, all right? And as such, we should think about it with regards to evidence and reason. I uh, lead, as mentioned, uh, Columbus Rationality. I'm a very evidence-driven person, a very reason-driven person. So in any uh, point here, you should always think, okay, why, right? One reason, oh yeah, is Occam's razor, all right? If we have a person, 
they're walking around, they're talking to us, so on and so forth. And then let's say they, they die and they get cremated, they're not around anymore. That's a simple explanation. The idea that their soul is living on in some sort of fanciful afterlife is a bunch of added complexity. This added complexity is not backed up by fact. And so we can reject it as unnecessarily complicated. But we don't even have to refer to Occam's razor to know that death is real. We don't even have to postulate this. Because remember, we're talking about the death of the person, not the death of the body. And thankfully, science can understand what a person is. This wasn't always the case. Way back in the day, we scientists were dualists, just like everyone else. Okay? This is, again, the natural mode of human thought. And so scientists thought, for example, that you've got this external world, this body, and all sorts of things happen and interact. And you know, like light goes and travels through our eyes, and then it goes into our heads, and it maybe goes through some sort of special gland or something like that. And there it interacts with the soul. All right? It touches the soul and interacts with it in some sort of special way. And there's a kind of logic to this. There's a way in which this matches experience to a degree. I can understand why people like Descartes thought this sort of thing. The answer is that lots of things in the body space, in this external space, don't impact what a person is. People seem sort of like naturally different things. If I were to go and cut off your arm, you don't become a different person, right? You still think and feel the same sorts of things. Maybe you'll be a lot more angry at me, but uh, you'll still fundamentally be the same sort of person underneath. If I take your blood, you know, if I bleed you or something like that, you as a person haven't changed. These body things don't impact our personhood, our, our souls, our, our minds. But uh, this isn't always the case. And in recent years, centuries, whatever, uh, we have discovered that there are some places where you can poke some sort of neat thing and you get a change in personality. That thing is the brain. All right? We now have sophisticated enough techniques that we can go and ask, all right, so uh, you, you know, you're having some thoughts, you have some memories, you have some sort of skill or whatever, emotion. Where is that in the brain? And we can actually go and say, here is where it is. We're not very good at it yet. The science is still fairly young. But we can actually go and we can point out the location of certain things. Neuroscientists nowadays can actually go and find neurons that do things like represent the concept of Barack Obama. All right, this is encoded in a specific neuron. And when you see Barack Obama or something, this neuron is active. You can activate this neuron through a machine and make someone think about Barack Obama. This is the personness. Okay? It's in the brain, and it's tangible. It's touchable. So let's update that quote at the beginning. Let's update it to, you don't have a brain. You are a brain, and you have a body. This is better, but it's still wrong. Now, why is it wrong? Uh, it's wrong because, let, let's take, for example, this molecule right here. This molecule is called semi-heavy water. It's basically chemically identical to water. It's got a, two hydrogens and an oxygen. The change is that one of the hydrogens has an extra neutron attached to it, turning it into deuterium. Neutrons are neutral. They just make the molecule a little bit heavier. Okay? So most of the chemical properties of the water remain the same. And if I were to go and change your brain, again, according to the quote, this is you, I will, you know, let's say I replace all the water in your brain. Your brain is mostly water. Let's say I replace it with semi-heavy water. I'll have made it 56 grams heavier. This is a change to your brain. Is it a change to you? No, not really. You know, is this a different person? I don't think so. Why don't I think so? What sort of natural reasoning am I using? I'm thinking about, like, the thoughts, the memories, the experiences, the dreams, the hopes, the feelings of the person. Those are all still intact. This is a fundamental assumption of that I've been making, all right? That the personhood here is encoded in the bits and pieces of our minds. And these aren't 
physical things. These are mental things. These are informational things. This is the philosophy of functionalism. Functionalism holds that there's not some special magic land where souls lie, not some sort of special plane, but rather that minds exist as patterns in the material world. Just as you could draw a pattern on the sand of a beach, the mind is patterns in neurons. Okay? And the only thing that makes a person a different person is a change to that pattern. There's some cool things about this model. When you think about souls, it's sort of naturally to, uh, useful to think of them as atomic, uh, single things that can be traded or moved along or something like that. But this is a very simplistic model. If you unpack a person into all of these aspects, you start to get some room for complexity. Room for complexity is a very important uh, component of any good model. When we think about how we want to think about people, we should have the ability to say whether or not someone is more or less the same person from one moment to the next. Okay? I think that it's important to recognize that I today am not entirely exactly the same person as I was yesterday. Right? Some change has occurred. And if you were to go in and change my musical preferences or erase my memories or something like that, you will have changed who I am as a person. Personhood is flexible and fluid and not a strict uh, dichotomy or atomic thing. So this is my preferred version of the quote. You don't have a pattern. You are a pattern. And you have a substrate. Substrate is the, the atoms that make you up. Okay? And importantly, just like the sands on the beach can hold the pattern, and you can wipe that pattern away without the sands going away, people can go away without the matter going away. You still have a body at the end of someone's life, right? but the personhood is gone. Again, this is functionalism. So from a functionalist perspective, people are kind of like stories. This is a good uh, analogy, I think. This is the beginning of uh, Alice in Wonderland. And stories have a consistent structure. They're information in the same way that people are. Stories are not physical books. Physical books contain stories. The story is the pattern. And importantly, multiple books can have the same story. The story is not the ink, nor the pages, nor the cover of the binding, even the pictures. Okay? The story is the information that's there. Now, this is a talk about cryonics. You uh, did not come to the wrong place. But uh, I think that it's important to understand functionalism. I started with functionalism here so that you'll understand where I'm coming from when talking about cryonics. Most people who are enthusiasts of cryonics, like I am, are coming at it from a functionalist perspective. And there's one fundamental thing that we need to talk about with functionalism before we go into cryonics, and that is death. So if we adopt a functionalist perspective, what is death? Right? If people are information, then how do we think about death? There are actually a, a, a couple different ways to think about this. But my preferred definition, and the definition that I'll be using for this talk, is information loss. Death is what happens when the information, the pattern that makes a person up, gets wiped away. This is the beginning of Alice in Wonderland, as you might see it encoded in a computer as ones and zeros. And in a computer, when you uh, delete a file, actually a little bit more technical than that, but I'll gloss over that. When you delete a file, it wipes that memory. Okay? It'll turn all this information into zeros, and that pattern is gone. This is something of a one-way thing. When the file is deleted, when the person dies, there is no way to bring them back. That information is gone. You'd have to you know, create a new person if you wanted a person around. And uh, this matches, this is a correspondence with my intuitions about death, that death should be a sort of a final thing, right? and that once someone is dead, they're dead. I'm going to keep this definition of death as information loss in mind moving forward. Oh, uh, keep in mind that information loss also gives us lots of room for complexity. It matches this sort of criterion for models. If we imagine that a person dies when the 
information that makes them up, when the patterns that make them up are wiped away, we can imagine that, you know, sometimes a pattern is wiped slightly away, right? In the case of forgetting things. In a way, that's kind of like a partial death, right? If I were to go and erase all of my memories or my personality, there's a way in which I would be somewhat dying, okay? And this, there's a gradient from alive to dead. And it's very important that we don't think in terms of a false dichotomy, alive, dead. But we instead understand that people move along this spectrum as uh, things happen to them. Okay, so let's talk about cryonics. This is a, enough philosophy, okay? So, as I mentioned, cryonics is about preserving people at low temperatures. But before we get to people, let's start with the North American wood frog. The North American wood frog is a cute little critter that has a fascinating ability. Every winter, it freezes solid, okay? And it sort of does this intentionally. It doesn't really intend to do it, but there's a way in which this is very useful to the frog. From the purposes of, like, clinical death, it's dead. It's not breathing, heart's not beating. The synapses in that frog's brain are not firing. The metabolic machinery inside that frog's cells, not moving around. It's static, okay? It's dead. Except that when spring comes, the frog thaws out. This is why it's useful, is the frog is able to endure cold winters, and then it returns to its froggy business. You know, ribbit, ribbit, goes on with its life. And then the next winter, rip, it goes into cold storage once again. And the North American wood frog is not the only animal that does this. It's one of the only animals that sort of uh, does this regularly. Uh, but there are other organisms that do this. This is a picture of some bacteria that from the last ice age. Scientists successfully took these bacteria and brought them back to life, uh, thawed them out, right? Uh, and they were alive again. Uh, this is a water bear that's a human embryo. This sort of thing being reduced to a very low temperature and then revived back to a normal functioning uh, condition is fairly normal among small organisms like single-celled organisms. But it's, it's been known to happen even uh, with animals like lobsters. Let me tell you about a fascinating uh, experiment that was done in 2005 by the University of Pittsburgh. The experimenters there had a number of dogs. And they took these dogs and they bled them out. They removed their blood, and as they did so, they reduced the temperature of these dogs to just above freezing. Not below freezing, but just above it. They cooled them down until they were very, very cold. And these dogs ceased to breathe. They ceased, their hearts ceased to beat, so on and so forth. If you were to walk into the room where these dogs were being held, you would say, those are dead dogs, all right? And they were this way for three hours three full hours. And then the researchers started to warm them back up, and they pumped the blood back into their systems. And after some recovery, you had happy, healthy dogs again, having not been permanently damaged by the process. Three full hours. That's a long time. One of the important things about uh, being a mammal is that your brain is awfully uh, squishy, soft, and vulnerable, this thing. If you don't believe me how, how the, uh, vulnerable this is, try holding your breath for three minutes, let alone three hours. The brain needs oxygen in order to survive, and in the absence of oxygen, it will break down and decay. Brain death starts in only minutes. And again, when brain death starts, that doesn't mean the organism is dead. Death is a spectrum process. And so it will move along that spectrum as time passes. But in the absence of anything special, the brain will die without oxygen. But these dogs survived for three hours without it. How did they do that? It was because of the cold. The cold protected them from death. We can think about the body as like a machine, a collection of trillions of tiny molecular machines that sustain us. And like any machines, they sort of, they have natural requirements in order to function well. 
sort of like uh, machines in a factory require lubricant and oil. The machines of our body require things like water and oxygen. In the absence of these things, our machines will naturally grind themselves up. This is what happens in your brain when you are uh, deprived of oxygen. But the cold protects people. We have a concept of clinical death. Clinical death is what happens when a person goes into a hospital and they uh, cease to breathe and their heart stops beating. Once upon a time, that was just death, right? We said, all right, you're not breathing, you're dead. And then we invented CPR and suddenly death moved as a, a target, all right? Nowadays, you give up on CPR after a while, the person's flatlined for long enough, and the doctor just sort of arbitrarily decides, looks at the clock on the wall and says, time of death is 7.26 p.m., okay? That's clinical death, but it's not death from a functionalist perspective. It's not information theoretic death. The person is still somewhere along that spectrum, moving from alive to dead. And if we had more advanced technologies, something like CPR plus or whatever, we could bring them back. It's just that we don't have that, so the doctors give up. That's what clinical death is, is the point where the doctors give up. Now, we talked about the cold preserving, right? This is because heat, in a very you know, basic physics sense, is all about motion and change. And cold is about stasis and stillness. The brain will naturally chew itself up when deprived of oxygen. If you cease to breathe or your heart stops beating, the blood is not able to go to your brain and it will shut down because it doesn't have enough oxygen. It will start to tear itself up and you will die. Unless you are cold. This is what protected those dogs. The cold slows down the machinery that would no naturally tear up those cells. Now, cold is not typically thought of as something which protects people. If I go out and jump in a lake in the middle of winter, you probably aren't thinking, oh yeah, Max is gonna be just fine, right? That's a very dangerous thing to do. Why is that a dangerous thing to do? What is it about the cold that hurts us? It's not that cold is dangerous by itself. It's because of this, ice. Water, as I mentioned, is most of our body. And water is very nice most of the time, but it has this unfortunate side effect that when you get cold enough, it turns from a nice smooth liquid into a sharp crystalline solid. There's lots of problems with this. It's sharp, as I mentioned. It also expands as it forms compared to the water. All right. Most importantly, for, the, for our purposes, when uh, water freezes, it will freeze at a lower temperature for uh, areas that have more salt. And inside our cells, there is more salt than outside. So ice crystals will start to form outside of the cells as they form the amount of water outside the cells, free floating water, goes down, and osmotic pressure pushes water out of the cells. As it does so, the cells get drier and drier, more desiccated, as the water moves out and freezes, and eventually the cells will rupture and collapse due to dehydration. Ice is bad, okay? But the cold is kind of good. If we want to preserve people using the cold, what we need to do is work around ice. If we can get past ice, we've gotten past the primary hurdle that prevents us from doing basically what the North American wood frog does. So how does the North American wood frog survive ice? The solution is actually pretty simple. The frog uses a uh, variant on sugar, sort of a natural antifreeze called a cryoprotectant and it will pump a lot of the water in its body to special sacs that are allowed to freeze into ice crystals. But most of its cells, the cells in its brain and its heart and those sorts of things, are flushed with this natural cryoprotectant. And what the cryoprotectant does is it prevents the water in those cells from freezing and turning into ice crystals. Just in the same way that ice reduces the freezing point of water, it's possible to remove the freezing point of water entirely and make a solution turn into what's called a glass. 
A glass is a different kind of solid, much like a crystal. Uh, except where a crystal has a rigid, orderly structure, a glass is much like a fluid that has simply stopped moving. The process of turning something into a glass is called vitrification, and this is what cryonicists are attempting to do with humans, is reduce them to a temperature where they vitrify, turn into a solid without the formation of ice crystals. This was actually done fairly recently. Uh, there has been breaking news in the cryonics front. This is a new technology, and in February of this year, the Bra uh, Brain Preservation Fund, or prize, yeah, Brain Preservation Prize, was won, won by a team that took a rabbit brain and successfully vitrified it by lowering it, its temperature and using a cryoprotectant. And then, once it was well below the uh, point of freezing, they brought it back and flushed the cryoprotectant from its system. The tissues were undamaged. All right. This is a technology which exists right now. We have the ability to vitrify tissues. So, this is cryonics in a nutshell. And there are unsolved problems. I don't want to give you the impression that cryonics is a proven technology. No mammal has ever yet been successfully brought down below freezing for a long period of time and then revived. Okay? But this sort of thing is being explored right now. And we have technologies for vitrification. These are engineering problems that have yet to be solved. Places like the army are looking into this sort of technology for doing things like uh, treating wounded soldiers on the battlefield by reducing their body temperatures. And there's ongoing research. Now this is important that while there are unsolved problems, no experts in this field think that cryonics is impossible. In my research, I have read a decent amount about cryonics, and there are journals and white papers that cover this sort of thing, but there are no journals and white papers by experts talking about why cryonics cannot work. If you ask people in this field whether or not this technology is viable, they will always say, yes, in principle, we just need to work out the engineering problems. But there are a lot of people that say cryonics is bad or won't work. Criticism of cryonics is pretty frequent for a number of reasons. Here are some of them. People say, it's unnatural, or you're playing God. Right? That's just science fiction. It's pseudoscience. Death makes life meaningful. Right? These are criticism that is launched against cryonics by people who are outside the field, who have some sort of knee-jerk reaction to it, or it doesn't smell right to them. It's a sort of passes as some sort of sales trick or something like that. They don't understand the science. This is the dream of the cryonics patient. Let's say you go into the doctor's office and the doctor says, I'm very sorry, but you've been diagnosed with stage four cancer and you only have six months to live, okay? You can try to battle this cancer, but chances are, even if you do, you'll only live a few months more, maybe a year, something like that. So you say, okay, instead of doing that, I'm going to get cryopreserved. So you go to uh, a special office where you get anesthetized and you fall asleep. And then the doctor takes care of the rest. All right? And if society flourishes and medical problems are solved, we move into a future, maybe something like Star Trek or I don't know, pick your future, where cancer is not so much of a problem. And we can fix that sort of thing, but you wake up and you're revived and then you can live a life in the future with whatever loved ones also were cryopreserved or manage to survive there naturally, okay? Or, you know, maybe uh, you're more like me and you think that this uh, idea of being biologically revived is not as uh, plausible as the idea of your brain being scanned. Right now, brain scanning technology is a real thing. We get more density of mapping neuron and neural connections every day, and Moore's law continues to increase processor power. So maybe, you know, one day, people will get their brains scanned, and then you'll run a simulation of them on a computer. So the cryonics patient wakes up in some sort of Tron universe like this. And this, this feels kind of like science fiction, right? We can sort of see why 
uh, someone might have a knee-jerk reaction of like, oh, cryonics, you know, that's, that's a load of crap, right? Because it pattern matches as magic. It pattern matches as wishful thinking or that sort of thing. Now, it's important to recognize that the conclusion of an argument doesn't invalidate the premises. The only thing that would make cryonics actually invalid is a problem with the reasoning that I went over earlier about why that technology uh, might or might not work. And it's important to recognize that once upon a time, this was science fiction as well. Heavier than air flight. All human endeavor in technology is, a, you know, sort of a science fictional thing at first. This is the fundamental problem behind engineering and exploration, is we're doing the impossible. We're going places that no human has ever gone before. So, you know, the natural reaction is, well, that is impossible, right? You can't do that. I've never seen anyone do that. But why? Why can't we do this, right? What are the logical principles that prevent it? If there aren't any, then it's kind of like a matter of time and energy and human will that moves us to the point of, from science fiction to science, right, to practicality. And then you have things like, you know, phones in your pockets that are just boring reality, right? Once upon a time, this was science fiction, only a few decades ago, in fact. And now it's just taken for granted. Okay, so I plan to be cryopreserved. I'm signed up for cryonics. But this talk is not to try to convince you to sign up for cryonics. You do what you want, all right? The point of this talk is to convince you that cryonics needs to be taken seriously as an option. Once upon a time, cremation was seen as like sort of heretical. It was like, ah, oh, you're getting cremated? Weird, right? Now it's sort of normal. Lots of people plan to get cremated. And the movement from the outskirts to a sense of normalcy is very important for giving people the knowledge and that option that allows them to pursue it if it feels compelling to them and if that's where they want to put their time and energy. So cryopreservation right now in the United States costs somewhere between the order of uh, 30000 to $200,000. I don't know if you're like me, but that feels like an awful lot of money, right? Uh, but there are some reasons to think that that number isn't as large as it might feel. First of all, cryonics is a one-time cost. And if you're young like me, you can do something like sign up for life insurance. And the life insurance policy can pay for your cryonic suspension. And then it's just a very small monthly fee uh, that you can basically pay out over time. There are also things which cryonics replaces or stands in for. Cryonics is, in a sense, an alternative to other end-of-life care, things like traditional burials, okay? Uh, consider the instance of the stage four cancer patient that I talked about before, where they are uh, opting to be cryopreserved instead of doing some sort of risky medical treatment. This is an alternative cost that isn't being spent in the case that you opt for cryopreservation. The United States has a healthcare problem. Per capita, compared to other countries, similar countries, we spend way more on healthcare, especially the elderly. And, I, and this is uh, age and annual per capita healthcare cost. The red line is the United States. And I can understand why people do this. Uh, you want to live longer. Life is valuable and important. I really do understand this, and I don't begrudge anyone for spending money on this. But look at the costs here, okay? We can look and we can see $30,000 is the same sort of thing that the average person who is 70 is spending per year of life. If you multiply that out by however many years of life someone has uh, remaining, that's way less, or way more, sorry, than cryonics, all right? I'm not saying that all old people should be cryopreserved. I'm just saying that this sort of money is being spent regularly keeping people alive. And cryonics is, in a sense, a cheaper option. But let's not talk about just normal healthcare. Let's go for something even worse. Let's talk about Alzheimer's, okay? Alzheimer's is a terrible disease. From a functionalist perspective, we can understand just how terrible Alzheimer's is because Alzheimer's is what it looks like to die as a person before you've died as a body. Alzheimer's, you get to watch the person die in slow motion. 
from the onset, it takes an average of eight to 20 years for an Alzheimer's patient to die. That's not true. That's eight to 20 years till clinical death. But of course, we understand that they're dying well before that their body shuts down, okay? Alzheimer's patients are, go are, are, are shells without ghosts, okay? And this is, this is absolutely terrifying to me, the idea of slowly dying while my body is preserved, not just from the idea of what would it be like for myself, okay? But what would it be like for my family and friends and loved ones to watch me slowly die over the course of years and years and years, to forget their existence, to lose track of who I am as a person. Okay. This is a hugely costly process, both in terms of energy and care and emotional weight, but also in terms of money. Late stage uh, Alzheimer's care costs between forty and $90,000 per year. All right. And again, it takes years and years before a person counts as dead, even while they're still dying. Compared to Alzheimer's, cryonics sounds awesome. Cryonics is hope. It's cheaper than that. The person who finally dies a death to Alzheimer's, they, they're, they're gone forever, right? Well before their body has fallen apart. But the person who is cryopreserved, there is still the potential for their revival at a later date, all right? That uh, hope persists. But it's illegal. It's illegal to cryopreserve people who are Alzheimer's patients because it's suicide or murder, depending on who you're asking. The state defines uh, clinical death as the important death, all right? So if you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's and you don't want to die a slow uh, actual death, right, then it, you can't kill your body legally. Right? No doctor will support this. Uh, this is the slide in my talk that is out of order. I will just say that cryonic scales very well due to physics and skip it. It was meant to be earlier. So there's some resistance to uh, cryonics. Right? There's some resistance to this idea that maybe Alzheimer's patients should be allowed to clinically die, aka stop their breathing and heart rate, to preserve their brains, because that's the important bits. All right? It comes from religious communities that say that cryonics is unnatural, or that people who are interested in cryonics are playing God, trying to live forever. This seems kind of silly to me, the idea that trying to live forever is a bad thing. Like, oh, are you trying to live forever when you're combating cancer, okay? When you're trying to not die one day to the next? This is living one day to the next just as anything, okay? Um, just because cryonics is implemented doesn't mean people will live forever. It just means fewer people will die, and frankly, I uh, would rather fewer people die. So this is why I'm talking to you tonight, because you as humanists, and free thinkers have the opportunity to be on the vanguard for a very important social issue that not very many people recognize. Okay? The moral right to be cryopreserved is an important thing which will become even more important as the technology develops and matures and becomes more popular. And there will be resistance from religious people, from especially extremist religious people, who see this as unnatural. And we need to uh, push back against that and allow people the option, regardless of what you yourself are interested in. People right now are dying. By the time I say this sentence, 15 people will have died. Okay? We can't save all of them. We don't have the resources in place to save every single life. But we can save some of them. And we can save people like cryonics, uh, sorry, uh, Alzheimer's patients who are dying slow and agonizing deaths, and we can save money while we're doing it. Okay? The technology hasn't been proven for revival, but we can vitrify people right now and slow down processes which are eating away at them. People who are interested in doing this, right, and have the money and resources to do so, if we as a community 
can offer the will and the support and make it less like some sort of weird science fiction thing. Like, oh, I don't know about that, right? The more normal this becomes and the more talked about it becomes, the more good that we'll do. And remember, all technology sounds like science fiction at first. Thank you. Yes, I understand that my whole life is just a blink of an eye. The history of the earth is with each moment that goes by. But this moment that I live in you feels like time has stood still. It feels somehow like it matters. And that it always will. Thank you so much.